Welcome to Truth in History. God's true people, Israel. Revelation of God's plan. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Mystery of God shall be finished. Kingdoms become kingdoms of Christ. Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. One of the most perplexing questions of biblical and secular anthropology can be summed up in four words. What is a Jew? Thousands of sermons have been preached about Jews without ever defining what a Jew is. Most churchgoers realize that the Jews have some connection with biblical history, yet lack a thorough understanding of who and what a Jew is. In certain religious groups, accusations have been made against those who would dare to question the party-line position regarding this subject. The very discussion of the Jewish question sparks a volatile explosion as rhetoric takes precedence over logic and facts are overruled by cliches. Nowadays, most evangelical churchgoers have been bombarded with sermons which include the following. The establishment of the Zionist state in Palestine as the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The blessing and cursing of non-Jews based on their treatment of the Jews according to Genesis 12. The return of the Jews to Palestine as the greatest sign of Christ's rapture. Christ's return to rapture Christians to heaven. The Jewish people are God's chosen people and constitute all twelve tribes of Israel. These topics have brought about prophetic confusion, false hopes, and political turmoil in the Middle East. Most Bible students have failed to acquire an understanding of the origin and history of the people known as Jews. It is our purpose to give an honest presentation of facts as to the identification of the Jewish people from the Word of God, the Jewish Encyclopedia, and Jewish authors. The word Jew is a contraction of the name Judah, who was the fourth son of the biblical patriarch Jacob Israel. It has also come to refer to non-Israelite people who over the centuries have adopted the religion of Judaism and have assumed identification with biblical Judahites. The commonly accepted definition of the word Jew in the Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia is as follows. Yehudi specifically refers to a descendant of Judah. The name is applied to members of the tribe of that name or to those of the country of Judah. First Chronicles indicates that members of other tribes resided in Jerusalem in Judah. Therefore, after the Babylonian captivity, the term was used for all Israelites, since Judah then formed the larger part of the returning remnant. The above definition addresses the basic understanding of the term Jew, yet omits the vast evidence of biblical details that offers an accurate meaning. From the Wycliffe definition, one gets the incorrect impression that ever since the time of the Babylonian captivity, all Israelites are known as Jews. This has led to a false belief on this subject. One Jewish writer defined a Jew as anyone who perceives himself to be Jewish. This leaves the door open for any convert from any religious or ethnic background who accepts the religion of Judaism to become a Jew. Philip Bernstein says, Jews are members of a group held together for more than 3,000 years by a common faith and a common history. Many persons believe that Jews form a nation. Others claim that they make up a religious group only. But there is no single definition of a Jew on which all Jews agree. A person born into a Jewish family of a Jewish mother is a Jew, even if he does not practice Judaism, the religion of the Jews, he remains a Jew. But if he voluntarily gives up his religion to join another religious group, he ceases to be a Jew. If a man is converted to Judaism, he becomes a Jew by religion. 
His children will be considered Jews by birth if he marries a Jew. If a woman is converted to Judaism, her children will be considered Jews by birth. When speaking of the Jews, one must consider that the original progenitor of that genealogy lived more than 3,000 years ago. From evidence presented by Jewish authors, the people known today as Jews have a marked difference from those Old Testament people of antiquity, though they bear the same name. Through time, wars, migrations, encounters with other people, the adoption of cultural and religious customs, it is obvious how today's Jews bears a little resemblance to Judah, the man from whom they derived their name. Many modern Jews have no genetic blood connection with the patriarch Judah whatsoever. We shall explore six topics of the historical progression of Jewish identity from secular and biblical sources. The historical progression of Jewish identity, full blood Judahites. In God's election whereby to execute His plan for man, the family of Abraham the Hebrew was chosen. To Abraham and Sarah was born the promised son Isaac. To Isaac and Rebekah were born two sons, Jacob and Esau. To Jacob and his wives were born twelve sons, of which Judah was the fourth. After the death of Judah's two oldest sons by a Canaanite woman, to whom Tamar was married, she was promised the third son Shelah. In her impatience in waiting for the third son, she posed as a harlot in seducing her ex-father-in-law Judah in Genesis 38. Based on Judah's demand that Tamar be burnt with fire indicates that she was of the tribe of Levi, Judah's older brother. Both Ta Judah and Tamar were of the same genealogical stock. The book of Jasher says, And in those days Judah went to the house of Shem and took Tamar, the daughter of Elam, the son of Shem. Of this union was born twin boys, Perez and Zerah. Perez became one of the progenitors of the house of David in which Jesus was born. In 1 Chronicles 4 are listed additional descendants of Judah. Thus the extended family of Judah that formed the bulk of the tribe of Judah. These pure blood Judahites were later include the house of David, which were the good figs of Jeremiah 29. These Judahites would later accept Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. The Lord said, And I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. The Lord said He would make a new covenant with the house of Judah, which would be the Christian covenant under Jesus Christ. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The pure Judahites are the ones that are truly God's chosen people that have existed through Old and New Testament times unto this day. They were prophesied to dwell with the house of Israel, thus forming all thirteen tribes. Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. Eight years after the kings of Assyria took the Israelites of the northern kingdom into captivity, Sennacherib took people of the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. In this captivity and deportation of Israel into Assyria and points north and west, all thirteen tribes were represented. They never returned to the land of Palestine. A large number of the good fig Judahites were part of the Israelites that centuries later would accept Jesus Christ and be located in the lands that would comprise the nations of Christendom. Number two, mixed blood Judahite Canaanite. The first three sons of Judah were born of a Canaanite mother. 
the first two sons of this woman left no offspring. The youngest son, Shelah, became the progenitor of a mixed family seed line. He being a half-breed of Judahite and Canaanite blood, it is imperative to recognize the curse that was placed upon Canaan, the father of this family tree. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan. The Canaanites were perpetual enemies of God's people Israel. The Lord forbid His people to intermarry with them when they possessed the land of Canaan. Shelah was one of the grandsons of Jacob that went with him down to Egypt. When the Israelites left Egypt, Moses wrote that a mixed multitude went up also with them. Could this mixed multitude refer to both non-Israelites and half-breed Israelites such as Shelah's family? Hundreds of years after the Exodus, the family of Shelah was living in the nation of Judah. Could these half-breed Judahites that had the blood of the cursed son Canaan be the bad figs during Jeremiah's day? And as the evil figs which cannot be eaten, they are so evil, surely thus saith the Lord, and I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them, till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. After the return of the people of Judah from the captivity in Babylon, Ezra reprimanded many of them because they had married foreign wives. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. In the book of Esther, during the Medo-Persian Empire, after the intrigue of Haman was overturned, the power of the Jews increased. These Jews were no doubt the evil figs spoken of by Jeremiah. They did not return to Jerusalem, but remained in Persia and became very influential in religion, finance, and government. After being saved from destruction, these Jews exercised fear over the people. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Thus is one more incident when thousands of heathen people adopted the religion of Judaism, intermarried with the Jews, creating an even greater mixture of blood. These unlawful mixtures clearly show that many of the Jews of Old Testament times were not pure blood Judahites. Their descendants were in existence when John the Baptist refused to baptize them. Number three, religious proselytes to Judaism. The period of time between the return of the Judahite Jews exiles from Babylon and the birth of Jesus is from the book of Malachi to Matthew, covering about 400 years. During this time, the nation of Judah went through a lot of turmoil in its leadership and relations with surrounding nations. It fought wars, conquering, and being conquered. Jewish historian Lewis Brown wrote, but despite the efforts of the priest, foreign influences did seep into the life of the people. Gradually their language was corrupted from pure Hebrew to a jargon called Aramaic, so that after a few generations they could not understand even their own scriptures. In their synagogues each Sabbath, for those meeting houses they had created in the exile had become common now throughout Judea. They had to read their holy writings through an Aramaic translation called the Targum, and many of their religious ideas changed too. The Jewish people became Hellenistic or Greek in their cultural way of life. Due to the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire, Judea became a part of the kingdom of Syria in 198 B.C. The Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes implemented harsh rule over the Jews in their cultural and religious practices. 
Number four, forced conversion to Judaism. Jewish historian Lewis Brown outlines events that followed the Maccabean victory of 165 B.C. under the Jewish general John Hyrcanus. He writes, In pursuance of his dream of carving out a great empire for himself, he hacked down the Samaritans not content merely with making those lands subject to his rule. He even compelled their inhabitants to accept his religion. Forcibly, he converted them to Judaism. John Hyrcanus took his vengeance out on the Syrians and conquered many of their cities. The Jewish Encyclopedia states, after victoriously ending the war in Samaria, he proceeded to subdue the Edomites. He hired foreign troops, dismantled Adora and Marissa, the strong places of Edom, and forced the Edomites to accept the Jewish religion and to submit to circumcision. This is the first instance of forcible conversion in Jewish history. For to the Edomites belong the family of the Herodians. Lewis Brown writes, For a while an Edomite half-Jew named Herod managed to get control of the land. By conniving with Rome, he had himself made king of the Jews. And then in unspeakable cruelty, he battered his people into submission. And then he built a magnificent new temple in belated effort to win the favor of the Jews. Jewish scholar Solomon Grezo said, Of course, Herod considered himself a Jew. This is proof that there was a strong Edomite influence in the religion of Judaism. These wicked Edomites were descendants of Esau, whom the Lord said he hated. To Amalek, Esau's grandson, God declared his hostility. The Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Biblical history records that the Edomites had intermarried with the Canaanites and the Ishmaelites. It would be 120 years for these Jewish Edomites to scheme their way into positions of power in the political and religious parties of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. John the Baptist called them a generation of vipers. Jesus admitted that Abraham was in their lineage then admits they had another father. Was our Lord referring to Esau? Jesus exposes their family lineage when He said, If ye were Abraham's children, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father will ye do. Could this family lineage and corrupt spiritual condition of the Jews account for their hostility and hatred against Jesus? and his followers seen in the book of Acts? Knowledge of the ancestral lineage of many mixed-blood Jews helps to shed light on Jesus' description of them. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Jewish by geographical location and religion. One way for non-Jews to be considered Jews would be simply by living in the geographical land of Judea. Many Bible students fail to take into account the influx of non-Judaites that had entered the region of Judea, such as the Syrians and Edomites. Often the impression is given by Bible teachers that everyone living in Judea were direct descendants of Judah, the son of Jacob. They continue in their error by teaching that the people of today known as Jews are direct and pure blood descendants who can trace their lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without interruption. This simply is not true. There were Israelites of other tribes living in Judea, the parents of John the Baptist. Both Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were not Judahites or Jews by genealogy, but Levites. Anna the prophetess was of the tribe of Asher. These people were not Jewish by blood, but in a generic sense considered to be Jews because 
they were living in the land of Judea. Most of our Lord's apostles are believed to have been Benjamites by blood and not Jews. Judas Iscariot was possibly the only Jewish apostle among the original twelve with Edomite ancestry. This would explain his betrayal of Jesus. Paul the Apostle made it clear as to his genealogical descent from Abraham and Israel through Benjamin, his tribal father. He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. He was not a Jew by blood, but a Benjamite. Paul was a Jew only by religion because of his training and adherence to its laws. From these biblical references, it is plainly seen that every one living in the land of Judea were not Jews by blood. Many are referred to as Jews because of their geographical location and or religious training, making them Jews only by nationalistic or religious connection. Jewish by National Conversion One influential area of Jewish history is the story of the Khazars and their conversion to Judaism. The Jewish Encyclopedia says, Khazars, a people of Turkish origin whose life and history are interwoven with the very beginnings of the history of the Jews in Russia. The kingdom of the Khazars was firmly established in most of southern Russia long before the foundation of the Russian monarchy by the Varangians. It was probably about that time that the Kagan of the Khazars and his grandees, together with a large number of his heathen people, embraced the Jewish religion. According to the Masudi, the king and the Khazars proper were Jews. Jewish historian Lewis Brown wrote, we are told of a large tribe of Tartars called the Khazars, who in the 8th century were converted to Judaism and established a Jewish kingdom in southern Russia. Jewish scholar Solomon Grazel wrote, Around the year 600, a belligerent tribe of half-Mongolian people, similar to the modern Turks, had conquered the territory of what is now southern Russia. The merchants from the Byzantine Empire urged Christianity upon them. The merchants of Persia urged them to adopt Mohammedanism. But the royal family and the largest number of the nobility were impressed with Judaism. That was the religion they adopted. In his book, The Jews of Khazaria, Jewish historian Kevin Allen Brook comments on this national conversion to Judaism. The Jews of Khazaria recounts the eventual history of the kingdom of Khazaria, which was located in Eastern Europe and flourished as an independent state from about 650 to 1016. In the 9th century, the Khazarian royalty and nobility, as well as a significant portion of the Khazarian population, embraced the Jewish religion. After their conversion, the Khazars were ruled by a succession of Jewish kings and began to adopt the hallmarks of Jewish civilization, including the Torah and Talmud, the Hebrew script, and the observance of Jewish holidays. These Jews arrived in Poland in large numbers starting in the mid-13th century, and in Belarus by the late 14th century, bringing with them the Yiddish language and culture. The culmination of this westward trend was in the 1880s to 1920s, when millions of Eastern European Jews immigrated to the United States and Canada. After moving to Kievan Rus, they adopted the Slavic language and became known as Russian or Canaanite Jews. The 13th tribe by Jewish author Arthur Kessler says, This book traces the history of the ancient Khazar Empire, a major but almost forgotten power in Eastern Europe. 
which in the Dark Ages became converted to Judaism. Evidence indicates that the Khazars themselves migrated to Poland and formed the cradle of Western Jewry. In the bookshelf column of the Wall Street Journal, Edmund Fuller writes a review of Mr. Kessler's book. Are today's Western Jews really ethnic, Semitic, biblical Jews, or are most of them descendants of converted Khazars? On the implications of all this for the state of Israel, his view, again controversial, is that the case for the existence and preservation of Israel rests not on religious, biblical, or ethnic grounds, but on the United Nations decision of 1947 by which it was established. In summary, in the book, The Jews, Their History, Culture, and Religion, Melville Herskovitz wrote, Who are the Jews? A Jew belongs not to a race, but to a Jewish community. For our purpose, we shall define the word Jew to include all individuals of the so-called white races of mankind, who by virtue of family tradition do practice or whose ancestors did practice the religion of Judaism. This is in line with Parr's conclusion, based on the study of blood types, that there is seriological evidence that the Jews are a religion rather than a race. Joseph Jacobs says there are Jews both by religion and by birth, Jews by religion but not by birth, Jews by birth but not by religion. From biblical and secular evidence, it is clear that the modern day people known as Jews are not a pure race, but an amalgamation of different ethnic groups. It would be difficult to prove any claim for a pure and direct descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. With the above unimpeachable sources, we have a more accurate knowledge as to the true identity of the Jewish people. This historical data brought forth from Holy Scripture, the Jewish Encyclopedia, and Jewish historians informs us as to the background of the ethnic genealogy, religion, and migrations of the Jews. Many emotional and financial appeals are made to the Christian public for causes that may not be what they are reported to be. As followers of Christ, we should be wise, prove all things, and hold fast to that which is true. Only then shall the truth set us free. For any material offered on this program, or to be a part of this ministry, please write or call today. We thank you, and may God bless you for your response to this end-time ministry. Truth in History, where the Word of God is not bound.